got different, basically people telling you like what the work is and where you should find the work, and whether it's you know, in your looks, you know, whether it's you know in your own power, your own abilities, and you, know, you got the feminist movement, you got um, whatnot, right? But when it comes down to it, your work is you know as a child of God. Um, and then it can be as simple, like we're just talking about you know, as a brother, what can you do? Can you know, open doors for your sisters? Um, can serve them by holding things, walking them into their cars at night? Um, but really reinforcing that identity as you know, um, you're a child of God, you're also a daughter of God, and you're precious in His sight, and so on. Yeah, and I think in a lot of ways it does really start here. Because um, <clears throat> what you see yourself as, what you see as your identity, Right, it's kind of like um, who you kind of become as a person, right? And, and I say it is what you see yourself as your identity because sometimes you are something, but you don't believe you're something. Go ahead, Pythia. I think along those lines, especially in the um, like Asian American culture, it's so like I don't know. It's almost it's like kind of shame based in a lot of the things. Like we find our worth in praise, a lot of worth in like what our parents say we are and what we can do, what we can't do, that it's like, I mean, I, I mean, not to say like it's my parents' fault, but there are certain things that I think about myself and it's largely based upon what my parents have told me growing up, right, so. And, and, th and this is why scripture is so important, right? Because as a Christian person, you can be reborn, regenerate the Holy Spirit in you, right? Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior of your life. But yet people are telling you, well, you know, you're only worth as much as you make, right? You're only worth as, as who, who you marry, for example, right? or how, how, when you get married. Like that. And, and the thing is that your, your actual identity is in Christ. But what you believe yourself to be, right, is you believe yourself like, I, I'm only valuable if I dot, 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 right? So you start to act in those ways, and actually in against the ways you are as a Christian. I mean, that's why when you read the New Testament, right, you, if you look at a lot, a lot of what uh, the, the apostles write, it's basically affirming truths that were already there. All right, a lot of the way Paul teaches, he affirms things that they should already know. Right? And so that's why he opens his letters like, you know, praise you, you know, who are followers in Jesus, right? People who are Christians, guys who give praise to God. Let me remind you that you are dot, dot, dot. Right? And so I, I think, and I think that's, that's a huge way that we should live. You, you can't just assume that, okay, that person's a Christian, they should already be da da da, you know, whatever. Right? But, I mean, we have the church, we have the body together to continue affirming these things in other people. And to say that, you know, every day we wake up, our flesh, right, our culture and society, our, sometimes our circle of friends, kind of pulls in a different direction than what God in the Bible taught us to be. Right? And so, so this is definitely a key thing to what we should be affirming. Okay. Next. Anything else? Let's talk about nothing else we <laughs> Let me get something from the back group. Anybody over there? Carmen or Kelly? shopping with Carmen a lot over the rest of the season because now that we're married we have like more family and stuff we have to shop for alright and people expect more for us but not kids anymore you know so we actually have to give gifts now we can't just be like oh thank you so much for <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny right because if you go to a mall like what percentage of the stores would you say are, are catered to our women 90% yeah pretty much right like I'm at the mall I'm looking at the stores and like impulse buy yay Wow, this is actually really boring for me. <laughs> like, it's like nothing I want to look at. <laughs> you know? Um, no, th th this, this is a huge thing in our culture. Um, one of the things that I'm really encouraged by in, in OMF, working for Bishop Agency, is to see um, the amount of godly women who are beautiful without being materialistic. All right? Who are beautiful without being materialistic. Um, and then we're going to talk about more, more of this in a second. But... Um, you gotta get that. You gotta get that out of your head, right? You really have to get that out of your head. Like having more stuff or having more like more clothes, more makeup, more things like that makes you prettier. All right, and you know what? The, the, and this, this, a lot of this lesson would be for the guys, okay? And for the guys you come in contact with, don't affirm that in women. All right, don't affirm uh, 
consumerism of materialism and women. All right, so I give you examples of how we do that. All right, because a lot of times we do that by you know we all we have like some kind of like senior banquet or some kind of like special event at church, right? And the women who wear like the most elaborate outfits, right? You know this like those dresses cost like an insane amount of money, you right? Like those are the girls that we flock to, and we talk to more. <clears throat> so with the girls that wear more simple dresses, like we don't kind of notice as much. You're you're basically affirming materialism, all right? You really are. Or like you know, or e even this like just a really stupid example, right? Girls girls who go on like Facebook and post like you know all the expensive things that places they've eaten or like the things they bought, and you're like, well, that's so cool, right? Da da da, and like you're really affirming those actions. You're basically encouraging the girls to do those things, right? You really are. And so a, a lot of it, a lot of it has to start with guys. You know, as 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 men in the church, if we don't affirm certain qualities in girls, right? Not to say like we just, just judge them, right? You can do that too. You can be like, oh my gosh, you're so evil. I cannot believe you bought that. Right? You're the most evil person in the world. <laughs> That's equivalent to killing puppies. <laughs> All right, I'm not saying that, uh, but I, I am I am saying this. It's it's. I'm not saying you should focus on the negative, right? You can just be like, oh, judge them. But I'm saying is that look for the positive to infer. Right? I mean, look for those in the church who are doing the things that um, we're seeing right here and affirm that. You know, because we, do, we don't do a really good job of affirming like, the good things that we see in the church. Right? For example, all right, this happens sometimes but not very often. Like, when women serve in homeless ministry. Right? And say, like, let's say like, they give up something to serve in homeless ministry. Meaning, like, you know, they know that homeless ministry doesn't buy like, food for the homeless. And so they give up a purchase and they give that to the homeless. Do we affirm that? For the church? Okay, I mean, that's what I'm talking about, living simply. Because you can live simply and hoard, right? Asians are really good at that. <laughs> you can live simply and just have a big savings account. <laughs> okay? And then there's living simply where you're giving to others. And I think that's, that's something that we really need to affirm people. Okay? Next one. Let's get one more. Um, our group focused, I guess, on two main areas. One is like, how we use our words, like good communication, so being able to express your feelings, able to be honest, and able to express your words with gentleness. Okay. Honestly, gentleness. Now, why do you guys speak honesty, or like communication in general? Um, I guess we're talking about like you're always going to have differences among like who you relate to, but if you're able to be honest and also intentional about communicating with people, then you often are able to form relationships or bridges with people that you okay. wouldn't otherwise. What is the opposite of that? Like, what are you guys trying to avoid? I guess deception. Uh, I guess uh, I think that communication leads to a good contrast of people often hiding their feelings and then being angry but not really letting you know, and then it's just kind of bruise and difficult to do anything about Think. it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we put that a lot into class. But okay. And so, yeah. by being able to talk about it. <laughs> actually, this is wrong. This is like W. Yeah. It's actually W. Paul. Paul. Passive, 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 passive aggressive. Uh, passive Asian. Yeah. Passive Asian. Passive Asian. Passive Asian. Passive Asian. Passive Asian. Passive Asian. When we're able to talk about things, aggressive. Uh, usually can be kind of a mutual understanding, mm -hmm. and the way they work things out usually. Okay. Um, I'm, try, I'm, try, I'm trying to think, so, think of some, some examples that we can kind of see in the church. Um, yeah, but I do think that this this issue of honesty is, is important, and how we really, you know, in, in the kind of times we're in, it's really easy to put up front. Right. We actually talk about this in any age. We talk, we talk about, we, it's easy to put on a church face, right? And like Monday through Friday face. Right? You guys, I mean, you guys go to the youth group, you know, at church, you guys know what I'm talking about. We talk about this all the time, right? It's really easy to like Monday through Friday, you know, like you do like just really like jerk mean things, and then like, you know, Friday night and Sunday, I can't have church face. You know, like now all of a sudden, like, when I talk to guys, I'm not, I'm not as flirtatious, like I dress a lot more conservative, you know. Um, but this whole, the whole, this whole idea of honesty and being able to really relate to people the way you really are um, is really important. I'm not sure if I shared this, this story with you guys before. Um, I was at the post office, right? 
and then there's like this, no, so there's like this long line, right? And there's this woman, she's like talking to the person on the counter, and then like I was kind of like, okay, you know, it's close off, whatever. And all of a sudden I hear yelling, right? She's like, don't talk to me like I'm a robot, okay? I'm not like five years old, and like, you know what? I come here all the time, and then you need a da 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 da, and like, this is the same price, like, I don't want to deal with you, we're your supervisor. She is so messed up, and da da da, right? And we're all standing there in line, and we're like, <laughs> <laughs> It's just the post office. I don't understand. I get so fired up about shipping a package. Like, there's only like one thing she can do for you. Take a package to ship it. I don't understand what argument is about. Right? But then, like, being the funny guy that I am, I started recording her on my phone. Right? <laughs> but you know what I got me thinking though? Is like, you can't hide anymore if you're a jerk. Right? Because back in the day, like, you can hear rumors like, oh, that person's actually a jerk in, you know, 9 to 5 life. Right? But you're like, oh, that's just a rumor. But nowadays, like, you can actually record people, like, being like a jerk. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and post on YouTube, that's a day forever. <laughs> <laughs> all to say, right? That's, that's all to say, I mean, it's really, really important to have honest communication. And, and, and here's a couple things about that, too. You know, I think being honest, I'm going to have to break. Also means being vulnerable, right? And, and this is why this is important in a Christian. You can say, "I have no sins." I don't do that, right? All things that we like talk about are bad in church. I don't do that. I'm like the perfect person, right? And then come across in the way you talk to other people, right? You can just be like, "Well, yeah, that, that stuff is so bad. That stuff is so bad," you know. And then never be humble enough to admit that you have sins, sins of your own, right? And you can really, and that's, and I think that's really deadly for a church culture. Right, to have, to have a people who are like just unwilling to admit their own sins. Okay, and they're unwilling to share with their own small groups of like the actual sins they're struggling with. It creates a really fake kind of a culture. Right, and we really want to avoid that. We want to be a people who say, you know what, we believe in the cross. We believe that Jesus died for sinners. All right, not, not for people who were like born Christian. Okay, because if Jesus Christ died for sinners, and we come to celebrate the forgiveness, right, that Jesus brings to us, I mean, there's going to be a lot more honesty and vulnerability in how we communicate. All right. Um, and gentleness. <clears throat> so, some guys don't know this, but the women's fe feminist movement actually started um, a lot with missionaries. I won't say all of it, but a lot of it was with mission women and missionaries. If you think about any movement, right, a movement has to start with people you respect. Right? So, so in the late 1800s, were there people who were like, well, women's rights? Yeah, but people don't care about you. Like, don't listen to you. You're just like yelling and angry. <laughs> right? It's when some of the missionaries came back from the field and they said, well, yes, send us out as missionaries. Right? And we're like, doing all these, like, like, healing the sick, like, pushing the gospel to like, all people and like, you know, planting these churches. And then we come back to our own churches. All of a sudden, now we're like, you know, just serving lunch. That's the only thing we can do. Right? And they're like, this is ridiculous. And so that's part of how the women's <laughs> movement started. Obviously, since then, it's been hijacked, right? If you go to UCSD, you know, like, feminist studies is like, men are evil. <laughs> Women are awesome. <laughs> like, if you're a man in this class, you should feel bad about yourself, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's been hijacked a lot, but all to the, all the say, um, for, for men and women, gentleness is really important. Okay, the heart of gentleness, okay, the heart of gentleness is, is this trust in the sovereignty of God. I'll say that again. The heart of gentleness is trust in the sovereignty of God. If you're just really angry, agitated all the time toward people, right? Essentially, what you're saying about your life is that God doesn't know what He's doing. This world is so jacked up. Like people around me are so messed up. Like I cannot believe how messed up everything is, and I'm just gonna like just lash out at this world, right? And you see that people who are like not gentle are just really angry at the world, right? If you're gentle, you're saying. Yes, there's, there's situations in my life that are wrong. Yes, there are people that irritate me, right? Um, like, the guys, guys talk about this all the time. Like, 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 when guys talk about girls, like, some girls are just psycho, right? That's how a lot of guys talk about some girls. Like, they're just psycho. Like, anything goes wrong, they, like, blow up. They're like, oh my gosh, you're such a jerk! And, like, ah! <laughs> right? And, like, like, the guys are kind of just like, I don't know if you guys ever go out and see this, when girls, like, just start fighting it out, and the guys are kind of, like, in the background, they're like, Hey, how's it going? I'm doing right. Gentleness in women, right? 
when, when, when women like lash out like that, and you, you see all the time in popular media, like women like, oh my gosh, that girl's so catty, right? Again, it's, it's, it's saying that unless I fight for my rights, right, I'll never be heard. Or unless I fight for the situation and like just go crazy at everybody, right, my rights will be denied. A person who trusts in the sovereignty of God can be gentle. All right, a person who says, ultimately it's God who's in control. And, right, that my, my most effective weapon is prayer, right? That my most effective weapon is to move God through prayer for the situation versus, right, trying to change the situation by my actions. All right, gentleness is not passivity, okay? We always, often do that in the church. We associate passivity like, oh my God, that person, I'm just going <laughs> to... This is how I deal with everything. <laughs> All right, passivity. All right. it's, it's not what gentleness is. What gentleness is at the heart is saying, God, this situation is really messed up. Right? Like, the way people treat me is really messed up. You, like, God, please change people. And change me. And say, God, would you work in the situation, not my own power? Okay? Let, let's, let's, go to, let's go to a passage right now that is often talked about in terms of gender roles and things like that. Let's go to 1 Peter. New Testament, First Peter three. <clears throat> First Peter three. And just so you guys know, this this uh, this letter of Peter was written a little bit later in the life of the church, um, probably after the, like some of the, some of the letters of Paul. Um, and so this is this is when a lot of churches start getting established, and so Peter has to start doing like household code codes, like how do you live as a Christian now? Now that the church has grown so fast. Okay. In 1 Peter 3, towards the end of the Bible, <clears throat> I'm going to start with verse 6. And wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of you do not believe the word, that they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. And your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to adorn themselves. They had submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called her him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Okay. <clears throat> I want to show you guys and kind of focus on um, one section right here. Um, it says, Your beauty should not come from outdoor adornment, such as elaborate <coughs> hairstyles, wearing of gold jewelry, or fine clothes. What does that mean for us in Southern California? Right? Everything we have is elaborate. <laughs> Everything we have is like super flashy. Or if you're like a fob in SoCal, you're like super elaborate. <laughs> right? That's a combining of like Asian like ostentatiousness with like Southern California like vanity. Okay, um, think about what that looks like for us then. You pretty much can't buy clothes anymore, right? Like you pretty much cannot buy clothes anymore if you think about that, right? And you pretty much can't go to like a hair salon because everything here is like 30 bucks for women apparently. Because I have to pay Carbon's like haircut bills and I'm like, this is insane. Why can't you pay like five bucks and get like, you know, a buzz cut? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 I have friends in the South, you know, and they always criticize us, and they criticize me, like, you guys are just, like, so into, like, that kind of stuff. Like, fake tans, and, like, going to the gym, and, like, I go to the gym, right? And, like, just being, like, super vain on the outside. You know, the response to that can just be, let's not care about our health, let's, let's just, like, dress in, like, all flannel, <laughs> like, all the time, right? Let's go to, like, um, formal parties and, like, weddings in, like, really bad-fitting outfits. Right. You guys don't know about like some people at weddings are like you, know, you shouldn't wear that dude that's not appropriate. <laughs> um, like one of my one of my friends in the south like he's a, he's a high school teacher and then one of the kids went to prom with like a camouflage visor, right? And like I thought it was like one of those like rap camouflage visors like no this is like hunting like camouflage <laughs> visor. <laughs> right? And he was saying, he was saying like what is wrong with kids like why can't they appreciate this moment you know in high school. I, I think, I think um, someone that I think that's really helpful in, in this section is John Calvin. Okay, um, John Calvin was one of the early reformers. Um, he was like a big 
person in the city called Geneva, 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 Switzerland, right? And so what he did for Geneva is that he helped structure Geneva in a way to make it basically more, more Christ-like, right? Because he felt that, you know, you had to start from the head of the church, the head, the head of the government body, to kind of work downwards and then kind of set some rules. So this is kind of what John Calvin says. So John Calvin, he's, he's asking, you know what, does this passage then prohibit precious garments or, or, or jewelry? Because when we get married, what do we get? Like gold rings, right? Should we not wear them? Should we never give our wives, you know, jewelry, right? And, John, and so John Calvin's like, is that what he's saying, right? And should we base not just not buy clothes together? But so in your response, this is, this is what he says. If we did that, it would be an, immo an immoderate, all right, immoderate strictness, wholly to forbid neatness and elegance in, in clothing. And this, can be, this is old English, so I'm going to translate this. If the material is said to be too sumptuous, the Lord has created it. And we know that skill and art has proceeded from him. So then Peter did not intend to condemn every sort of ornament, but the evil of vanity, to which women are subject. Two things are to be regarded in clothing, usefulness and decency. And what decency requires is moderation and modesty. Were then a woman to go forth with her hair wantonly curled and decked, and make an extravagant display, her vanity could not be excused. They who object and say that to clothe one, oneself in this or that manner is an indifferent thing in which all are free to do as they please may be easily confuted. Because excessive elegance and superfluous display, in short, all excesses, arise from a corrupted mind. And so beside that ambition, pride, affectation, display, and all these things of this kind are not indifferent things. Therefore, those whose minds are purified from all vanity will duly order all things so as not to exceed moderation. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break that down. That's really deep. This is John Calvin. Okay? <clears throat> what John Calvin is saying is this. The Apostle Paul is not banning clothing. Okay, he's not banning clothing. And you, and you know <clears throat> something interesting. Lydia. So me guys will look this up later. All right? Seller of purple. Okay, purple was like expensive clothing back in the day. <clears throat> can you make nice things and can you be in fashion if you're a Christian? You can. Okay. But is, is there going overboard? Is there a way to dress where you to dress in that way to attract attention? If you, if you grew up in this culture, you should say yes. <laughs> All right? Because putting like spinners on your car or like putting gold in your teeth, right? That's vanity to the extreme, right? And that comes from California, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. All right? Um, there, there is a way in which you can dress where you're just saying, I want attention. Right, and that's why like a lot of men, a lot of designers now like girl stuff. Like the first time I ever saw like you know um, those girl sweatpants with like words on the butt, right? I was like, what is going on? <laughs> and now they all do that, right? Now they all have like words on the butt, right? That's like look here, right? Look at my body, look at me, right? Um, hey, let's be careful about that as Christians. Okay, let's be careful to not dress in a way that is vain. <clears throat> Let me put that in the positive. Let, let us dress in a way that's decent, appropriate, and modest. Okay, because I, I don't want us as a church to be like kind of immature and just be like, okay, we're going to go to weddings with t-shirts on, right? Because honestly, you know what that is? That's indecent, right? It really is. You, you're basically disrespecting the people who are getting married, right? You're basically saying to them that, you know, your wedding is not worth my time to, you know, to, to look nice. We, we, we did this, we have training for this in the Marines. Like, if you ever look at Marines, Okay, more than any other branch, right? We basically like spend hours teaching our, our recruits how to press your uniforms, right? How to press your uniforms, how to have your shirts look nice. I, I, you guys, here's a secret too, uh, why Marines look nice. We actually have these things called shirt stays. Pretty much only Marines wear them. Our shirt stays are like when you're wearing a dress shirt that's tucked in, it's, like, it's an elastic band that attaches to the bottom of your shirt that, that either hooks to your sock or under your foot. And what it does is actually pull your shirt down the entire day. Wow. All right? So basically, your shirt never becomes untucked. All right? And actually, it actually looks really, really good, right? Because then it basically looks crisp all the time. Okay? Um, why do we do that? You can be like, that. So you guys are soldiers, right? And you guys fight for a living. Why do you guys care so much about outer appearance? All right? It's kind of funny because the branch that does the most fighting, right, cares the most about outer appearance. <clears throat> we do that in the Marines, right, for a couple reasons. Decency is first, right? 
because one, one of the things we say is that we are soldiers, we hold ourselves to a high standard, right? And that should be reflected in the way we dress. And so like for, for Marines, like you'll, you'll never see like, you know, like wrinkles and like our, our uniform and stuff like that. We're not, we'll never be like sloppy with like, you know, everything hanging whichever way, right? And we're saying like, you know what? We hold ourselves to a high standard, right? And we want to exhibit to the world, right? That we are, um, that we care about the way we present ourselves to others. So that when we stand in front of like senators and dignitaries and presidents, things like that, right? They can say like, that is a person who holds himself to a high standard. All right, and our uniforms are like super expensive, right? But it is look nice, and I, and I think that's that's how we sh should be as Christians. And I, I think so. I, I think especially as, as Christian women, right? I want you guys to look at to look at beauty that way, to to look at fashion that way, to look at fashion and to, and to say, you know what? I care about the way God made me, right? I want to dress appropriately and modestly, right? To present myself, right? To pre present myself as a respectable person. Right, that's, that's, that's one of my words that I use a lot. Respectable. Okay, you want to dress in a way that it's respectable. That when, when, when people meet you, they can say, that is a dignified woman of God. Right? Um, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to kind of, kind of break down and talk, and talk about this. I will hope you guys, seriously, in your women's small groups, and discipleship times and stuff like that, really bring up that issue. Okay? Because let's not, let's not be naive. Southern California, right? Fashion is a huge issue. Right? How, we, how we present ourselves is a huge issue. Um, last part of this text, you saw uh, holy women of the past um, and how they, you know, and how they feared God. Um, as I promised, get my Facebook. Hey, if you guys are my friend on Facebook, you need to go on Facebook, add a friend, David Pat. All right, how to ask a woman out by text, biblically. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to go over that section right now. Hey, um, if you're about to open, you can follow along if you don't believe that this is from the Bible. <laughs> Okay, go to, go to Genesis 24. I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm just going to give you guys a reference passage. <coughs> Genesis 24. It's Genesis, the first book of the Bible. I'm, I'm going I'm to break down what's, what's happening in this passage. Okay. So Genesis 24, um, so you guys can see from the very beginning, right, Abraham was very old, and the Lord has blessed, has blessed him, but he said, hey, I want my son, I want my son Isaac to get a wife, right, not from the pagans, but from those who are going to be part of God's kingdom, right, God's people. Um, and you're going to be like, how is this about text messaging? <clears throat> you know, um, one of the things we can do when we ask people out is just to be afraid of, like, confrontation. Right, and that's why we use like impersonal means, right? Because we're afraid of like, you know, seeing people face to face. I think, but I think there's, there's another way, right? Where we can say, um, we want to trust in God. Okay, we want, we want to trust in God. So I'll, I'll, I, want, I want you to see, I'm basically to tell you the story. You can look down if you don't believe this is what, what's happening. Abraham says to his servant, okay, Abraham's like rich as a lot of servants. He's like, okay, I'm about to die, right? And like, if my son marries one of the, one of the pagan women, basically they're not gonna follow God. Okay, they're gonna go like Ishmael, right? Abraham's son Isaac and Ishmael. They're like Ishmael and just do like shady things. Okay, so I want you to go back to my own my own relatives, my own clan, and then get a wife from them. Okay, and, and, and then the servant is like, okay, man, this is gonna be nuts. Like, you want me to just go and to find a wife for your son, right? Like, you're kind of an important person. You know, like finding a wife is not the easiest thing in the world, especially for an important person. And Abraham says to him. The God who has brought me into this place, right, who has watched over every one of my steps, will guide you. I, I, I don't ever want to look over that passage of Abraham's faith. Okay? He basically says, God has already been so faithful to me. Will he not continue to be faithful to me now? Right? And he basically makes his servant swear, swear to him that he will at least try. Right? That he will give it basically his all. Okay? So, so bring it back to text messaging, okay? There, there's a way for us to think that, like, you know, dating in relationships is like a formula, right? That if I do dot, 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 then dot, dot, dot will happen, like, for sure. Because I read it in a magazine, like, how can the magazine lie? <laughs> right? <laughs> right, like, man, like, I'm going to just be smooth. I'm going to, like, learn how to play guitar. I'm going to learn how to play guitar. 
and I'm gonna play guitar, and I'm gonna be like, like so awesome, slick. I'm like totally like put her place and like sing to her on a balcony, and like she'll totally like wild with me. All right, you can do that. You can think that like it's all about a formula. And there's another way of doing it, and just saying, you know what, God is sovereign. You know, God is sovereign in that I want to be as faithful as I can, and even if like the circumstances are not the way I want them to be, God can make them work. Right. So just, just so you guys know, the only, only applicable way I can see text messaging working for dating, by the way, is if you guys are overseas. <laughs> Alright, if, like, if you guys are like overseas, and I, I, I've actually heard this happen before, uh, especially people who are like, missionaries or military, right, who are like overseas, and they ask a person out by text messaging. I think that's okay. Okay. Um, the, key, the key to all this is to say, in my method, Am I trusting God more than I am trusting myself? All right, and this is mostly directed to people who are like just really control freaks. In my method, am I trusting God more than I'm trusting myself? Or do I think that just because I took her to like a really expensive place that she'll go out with me? Or because like, I, you know, I'm just so awesome of a guy that she'll say yes to me? You know, or do we say that, you know, hey, God himself will direct us, right? God himself will bring his people to the right people. Okay, there's, there's, there's more to the story. There's more to the story, and there's the stuff that I want to talk about in this chapter. Um, so then Abraham's servant goes, right? Goes to the, the place where Abraham's from. And so he, he goes there, and he's like, God, what am I supposed to do now? All right, I, I, I'm in this strange place, and like, I have no idea how to find a wife. I'm supposed to go, go to women and be like, hey, you, be my master's wife. Right? Like, that's so awkward. Even in that culture, it's awkward. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is what he does. He's like, all right, God, I'm going to pray, and if a, and I'm going to see this fire well. And he says, if a woman comes and says to me, if she gives me a drink, right? And not only she give me a drink, but she'll water my camels, too. Because like, so my camels have a drink, too. Right? Because in the desert. And that will be the sign that this is the woman that you intend for our master. Right? And right as he finishes praying that, a woman comes up to him. It's like, hey, would you like a drink? And he's like, oh, great, this, this is happening. <laughs> this is happening. <laughs> right? And then, not only that, the woman says to him, um, can, I, can I water your camels too? Here's something I don't want you to miss in this chapter. Okay? Because you can just be like, this is God's sovereignty. Here's what well, I want you to notice about the woman. You, you, you can look down at your chest. <laughs> Number one. Right? Love. The woman actually stops for this guy. Okay, and you can just be like, oh, that you know, she should stop. And the fact of the matter is that she took time out of her day to help a stranger. And to not just help a stranger, but she want, wanted to help his camels too. Do you know how much water camels drink? <laughs> okay, <laughs> do you know how much water camels drink? You're living in a time and age where like water basically has to be like hand pumped out, right, and like welled out, and she's gonna water the camels. <laughs> All right, that is an insane amount of work. What does that tell you about her heart? All right, it's love. It's love and a willingness to work hard. All right? I mean, I know American culture, we like to be like, oh, women should be dainty and you should never work. Okay, no. Obviously, here in the Bible, you know, a lot of cultures, women work hard. Okay, working hard out of love for something that she doesn't even know. And I think the Bible is affirming that. Okay, I really, I really think the Bible is affirming that. And I think that Abraham's servant did the right thing. And saying, like, let, he didn't say, God, let the sign be that when I see 10 women walk by, the woman who's like radiating beauty, let that be like the <laughs> woman for my master. Right? Like, she, like everyone just like stops and looks at her, like, oh my God, what's happened? Right? He doesn't say that. He actually prays, like, let the woman who gives me water and my camel's water, let that be the woman. Okay? Number two? She's a virgin. Why is Bob mention that? Is sexual promiscuity only, you know, to our culture? Is it only to our culture? <coughs> Obviously not, right? I mean, getting having sex before marriage, before marriage happened in every happens in every culture. The fact that this that woman, this woman's a virgin. All right. The fact is, is that this woman kept herself pure before marriage. It's a huge thing. All right. You know, I'm not I'm not here to condemn anyone who's had you know uh, bad relationships and stuff like that. Okay, because because to those who've had bad relationships, um, who've been caught in sexual sin, let me just say to you, God redeems all things. Okay, and that we're not a church that's here just to find out who's bad, who are bad people, let's condemn them. 
Okay, but but we are a church that says we are all forgiven by Jesus, right? And we all aspire to be the people that God calls us to be. So, with that being said, you know, being sexually pure, right, is an extremely important thing. Okay, so so for guys, right, you need to look at your own lives and to really ask yourselves, right, um, how do I view relationships? All right. Because um, when I'm Christian guys, they, they basically view it as like, dude, I just want to hook up with girls because I'm like so lustful and like I need an object for my lust. Okay? And see, the thing about Christian guys is that we don't do it to that degree, but we do, do it to a different degree. Christian guys are like, I'm so lonely. And like, I'm going to fulfill my loneliness with a girl. Alright, now you think right now, some of your friends, you know what I'm talking about, right? All of us have friends like that. They're like, I'm so lonely, I just need a girl in my life. And so I can be, stop being lonely. That's that's seriously, seriously sexually immoral. Okay, I, I'm I'm, a, I'm serious with that. What I'm saying is that if you do that, if you're just like I need a woman to fill my loneliness, you're basically putting a woman who's not your wife, right, in basically kind of the partnership position of your wife. And you should be doing that for a married. Okay, you really shouldn't be doing that for a married. And for girls in the same way. Okay, really watch, right, your sexual purity before you're married. Right, and even when you're married, yeah, there's a lot of things you gotta do too. Okay, but this is something the Bible points out, that the fact that she's a virgin. Number three, okay. Um, if, you, if, you look at, if you look at the passage, what happened next, the woman actually invites him over to his house, right, like to stay with her family, <coughs> okay. Um, it's basically saying like, you know what, if you come to stay with my family, I'll, ooh, our family, my family will take care of you, right. And this is to a stranger, it's a stranger she'd never met before. Right? We, we will take time out of our days. Right? We will take food out of our supply. We will take supplies out of you know, our family's like, wealth to help you. That means a lot. Okay. Um, let's be a people that is welcoming of others. Let's, let's be a people who sacrifices ourselves to give to others. And we talked about earlier living simply. Right? And that's what I'm talking about. You know, how awesome would it be for a church in Del Mar Okay, where like if you look around, there's like six million dollar houses. For a church in Del Mar, it's being known as a church that sacrifices for others. For a church who lives under our means, okay, because if you get a job around here, you're gonna get paid like pretty big, just because the cost of living is so high. But let's be a church that lives under what we get paid and give that money to help others. Okay, and there's, there's seriously a lot, a lot of ways to help others. Okay, you, you go to you go to UCSD, right? You see homeless people all all the time, right, on those like crosswalks. How many times do we stop and care for them? I'm not saying give them money, I'm saying give them food, give them like blankets and stuff. Okay? How many times do we care about that? How many times do we go to like Mission Bay and stuff like that and see like, you know, people who are not as fortunate and stuff like that and actually care for them? And ask ourselves, how can we care about, you know, say illegal immigrants? How can we care for them more? How often do we say like, you know, people in convalescent homes, right, who don't have family come look after them? How, how often do we say like, hey, let me give us some time and just help them out a little bit? Right. There's a lot of things we can do. And so, <clears throat> and the, the thing about welcoming is that it's affirming the other person is created in the image of God. And that God has put people there to, to help meet needs. I, I mean, I especially see this a lot, you know, being a missionary and stuff. <clears throat> um, one, of, one of the questions that we always get asked is like, you know, why do we, why do we raise support? Right? Like, should missionaries just have super faith and like, you know, God help us to all win the lottery? Like every, every missionary should read all just in the lottery by faith, and then we'll have money for missions. Um, but the, the funny thing is, the, the way God does the work is through His church. Okay, so when you guys pray, right, for like super miraculous things, sometimes let me just encourage you guys. Sometimes the way God works through that is through the church. So when you when you ask like God, would you help the homeless? You know how God does that through people. So when you say, like, God, help my friends get saved, how my friends get to know Jesus Christ, you know how God does that? Through people. Through evangelists. Right? Through people who are saying, hey, let me just go spend some time with that person and share the gospel with them. Right? And so when you, when you pray, when you like, read news stories, right, about like, all the suffering in other countries, you know, and you say, like, God, you know, fix the situation in other countries, you know how God fixes it? Through people. Right? Um, working for a mission agency, like, we see, like, just, we hear about crazy stories, about crazy suffering. And we, we dream a lot. All right, we dream of like, how do we fix this? Is it because we don't have faith? Is it because we don't have faith that God can fix it? No. But we're saying that God is the one who does it. Okay? 
Yes, this is a le- this is a dating lesson. So guys, how do you ask out? How do you ask out girls? Again, affirm these things. All right. In the, in the last couple minutes, I'm just gonna run run down this list real quick. <clears throat> very practical, very practical stuff. Um, how to ask out girls? This is this is where Elliot Elliot does, <laughs> has come for this. <laughs> <laughs> how now? How do you ask out a girl? Um, just real quick. There's, there's, a couple, there's a couple options. You can be too passive. Okay, you can just be like, you know what, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. We'll just see what happens. <laughs> okay? okay. <laughs> Man, I, I hear this all the time. Okay, all the time from girls. Like, why does God just ask me out? Okay, there is a way of living where you think that God himself is going to be like, magically, like, magically bind you guys together. <laughs> so that your lives will naturally get closer and closer together. <laughs> It doesn't always happen, okay? Um, if it did happen, honestly, it would really jack up your marriage. All right? If you were passing your dating line, it's going to hurt your marriage like crazy. Because you know what's going to happen in your marriage? You're not going to pursue your wife. Ooh, I said that. Okay? If, you are not, if you're not seriously like focused and determined in your dating life, it's going to hurt your marriage so much. Because you're going to get in your 9-to-5 work routine, right? And so is your wife. Right? And you guys are do your own little lives, and you don't have no love in your marriage. Because you will never, ever take steps to love her in your marriage. That's dangerous. All right, that's so dangerous. <clears throat> do not be passive. Okay? Think, not, don't think about the dating relationship, but think about what you can be like in marriage. Are you going to pursue your wife in marriage? Are you going to, I mean, when, when you guys are married and your lives are just crazy stressed with a bunch of things going on, Right, you like go to people's houses at like 1 a.m. in the morning to like cast out demons. <laughs> like, are, are, you, are you just gonna be like that, that's our life? We're gonna have no romance. We're just gonna serve people. Hey, don't be passive now. Right, is your passive now? God should not bring you together because if God brings a woman to you, you will be a disservice as a husband. Right, you'll be a terrible husband, and God will curse that woman who is your wife. Okay, so do not be passive now. Same time, don't be too aggressive. Okay, you don't talk about you creepers. Do <laughs> 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 not be a creeper. Uh, hey, this, this is what I mean by creeper. Um, creepers are people who <laughs> try to get too much attention too fast. Okay, too much attention too fast. Um, and kind of just like don't trust the natural kind of progression of things. I, 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 heard this, I heard this joke from a comedian, and I thought it was really funny. It's like, like he went on the girl, like it's like their first date, right? And like he forgot his jacket in the car. And then she brought the jacket out of the car, and it's like she puts it on him. And she's like, oh, where would you be without me? Right? And he's like, I just met you. <laughs> <laughs> I just met you. Now you're like putting yourself in my life already. <laughs> um, I don't think Asians have a problem with this. Some Asians do. Um, don't, don't in, a, in a way, think that, like, the, like just because, again, what, what, I, what I just said before, the more you do, right, that, like, the more, the, the more perfect your method is, the more this relationship will work. Okay, it's not about that. Pursue in a way that, like, that respects her. All right, because it has, has to be two-way thing. Like, if you ask her, like, hey, do you, do you want to go lunch? And she's like, no, right? And you find out, like, do you want to go lunch sometime? And she's like, oh, yeah, I can go next week. Okay, then that means she wants to go lunch with you. If you're like, do you want to go to lunch? She's like, no. Like, you want to go to lunch next week? No. How about next week? No. Don't. That means she doesn't want to. <laughs> 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 that means continue as friends. Okay. I'm not saying just stop talking. I'm just saying continue as friends. All right. Maybe something will happen later. Hey, to, to be honest, I'm old enough now to have seen a lot of people who, uh, like in high school, they're like, get away from me, you're just like such a gross guy, but right, and they get married later. <laughs> and the girl's like so like in, like in love with her husband. It's like, oh my gosh, why are you leaving for like 10 minutes? I need you here now. <laughs> okay. But, you know, don't be too aggressive. Okay. That was big. God is not a matchmaker. <laughs> The, the positive of this is this. <clears throat> God has for you a bunch of available options. 
Right? I don't believe that God just has one person for you. Okay, and I say this because some people when they marry, when the partner passes away, okay, and they get remarried, all right, um, God doesn't just have one person for you. Um, so what does that look like when you ask somebody out? Okay, don't, please don't do this. Please don't go, God told me, to, God told me that you'd be my wife. Okay, dude, so many, you laugh now, but you guys know what I'm talking about. So many people do this. Okay, don't do that. Instead, say, okay, this is what you say instead. Instead say, I see these awesome godly qualities in you, and that's why I like you. Right? And I, and I think that you're an amazing girl, and I want to know you more. That's what you say. You don't say, God told you, told you to be my wife because of all these things. Right? Therefore, you for sure, you're my wife. Because these are all things I want in my life, and you have them. So, <laughs> God is sovereign. We're together now. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I'm just going to write this out for you guys, so it's, it's really easy. Okay. Step one. You have to stay for all the class to get this. Step one, asking girl out, affirm. Okay, affirm what is godly and admirable about her life. Okay, that's the first step. And I, and I do mean godly. You can just be like, oh my gosh, you have like the nicest hair in the world. Okay? <laughs> you can do that. Don't do that. Affirm godly qualities in a girl. Second, communicate and share life together. Um, <clears throat> this is how you make asking someone out easy. Right? If you guys are already communicating and talking a lot, and guys, this is, this is sometimes the way that you have to be kind of more diligent about, right? Look for ways you can talk to her more. Look for ways you can kind of share life with her more, right? And what I usually looks like for Christian is like, look for areas that she's serving in and like, you know, learn about those things. Learn about those things and figure out how you can serve more in those areas. You know, one thing that really impressed me about Carmen when we first started dating, is she took perspectives, all right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna advertise that more in Harvest. Um, she took a missions, like education class to learn what my missions was. That's what I'm talking about. You know, like communicating and learning more about each other, right, and sharing life together. And that, that brings you guys closer together. So that if there's like a girl or a guy that, you know, that you're thinking about right now, like how do you guys grow closer and maybe move towards dating? Figure out what each other, what, what each other are passionate about. Like not stupid things, right? But like, you know, godly, awesome things. Learn more about that and ask, can I, hey, can I help you in that? Right, if you love, you know, doing evangelism on campus, right, can you teach me more about that? Okay? So things like that. So find out a way to communicate more, to share life more with that person. Three. This, this is very indirect. Have your community help. Um, I think, I think the most effective way of asking a person out is not just to ask them out, like, straight out. Okay? I honestly think one of the best ways to ask people out is to talk to, the, talk to that person's community. Talk to that person's small group. Right? To get them on your side. This, this is also how marriage works, too. Right? <clears throat> honestly, I honestly think that if her friends, right, especially her disciple or her small group and stuff like that, her pastor, because of different churches, like you, right, and like, is already seeing good thing qualities about you, right, and then she has to know your community and stuff like that, your communities will help you put them together. Okay? Because your communities will affirm, like, hey, these people actually really do belong together. Like, they help each other out, they encourage each other spiritually, right? They're, and they're going to help you guys get together. Right? They're going to help us with, like, double dates and, like, random stuff. <laughs> okay? And again, the reason why this is important, because you're looking towards marriage. Because when you're looking towards marriage, your community is huge. Right? Not just because, not just because and this is, like, shocking to some of you, because you need bridesmaids and ushers and like if you like a candle and like all that stuff. All right, that's because of those reasons, right? Um, but your community keeps you accountable when you're married, and your, your community encourages you when you're married. Okay, so how do you ask a girl out? You go to your friends and you say, "Hey guys, what's up? What are you guys doing? Can I get to know you guys more? Right? What are you guys interested in? Um, like serve with them in the church? You know, just be friends with their with their friends." As your communities grow closer together, you guys will eventually kind of come together. Okay, that's the secret to dating. Go tell your friends. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the secret is to not to ask out directly, but to be indirect. 
Oh, it was, was it with the drive? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's getting a lot of ideas. Okay, that's good. That's right. <laughs> All right. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you um, for your word and that you give a light to our path. And what we know, just this issue of dating, um, relationships, asking people out, is such a crazy issue in our culture. Um, so God, change us. Renew our hearts. Cleanse our minds with your truth. And make us holy in your sight. All these principles and whatever is that have been applied today, God, make them specific for each individual here. Um, may your Holy Spirit give light uh, and guidance and wisdom to every individual so they can apply it for their own lives. Uh, if we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys.